The date is November 12, 1996. The survivor is Ida Glaserman Nelson. The interviewer is Adela Balafia. The city and state are East Meadow, New York. The country is the United States of America, and the language is English. My name is Adela Balafia, A-D-E-L-E-A-B-O-L-A-F-I-A. -E -A -A Today is November 12th, 1996, and I am interviewing Ida Nelson for the survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation. We are in East Meadow, New York. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Would you please say your name and spell it? My name is Ida Nelson, N-E-L-S-O-N. And do you have any nicknames? <clears throat> yes. I, well, I had a nickname in France, and my nickname was Didi, <laughs> which I did not like. But uh, I had that nickname because I, was, I had the same first name as one of my cousins. So in order to differentiate us, uh, I was given, right from the time I was born, I was given the name Didi. So um, the first 25 years of my life, my name was Didi Glazerman. And then when I came to America, I became Ida Glazerman. Totally different name, different country, different everything. <laughs> Could you give us your date of birth? Yes, uh, I was born November 12, 1921. And how old are you today? Today is my 75th birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. <laughs> and what city and country were you born in? And please spell the city. I was born in Paris, P-A-R-I-S, France. Could you describe what Paris was like for you as a child growing up? Um, I realize now that I had a very nice childhood. Uh, my parents were married in 1921, and uh, what my, were their names? All right, their name was uh, Joseph Joseph Glazerman, and my mother's name was Sima Glazerman. Uh, she was born Hoffman, and uh, when they married, my father. Uh, had come from Romania and they emigrated after the First World War to France. And there I started a fairly successful import-export business and so was really rather well to do when he married my mother. So uh, the first years of uh, my life was very, uh, very easy in a sense. Was your mother French-born? No, my mother was born in Ismail, which is a small town near Odessa, in uh, Bessarabia, which was a province that uh, was taken sometime by the Russian and sometime by the Romanian. When she was born, it was a Russian uh, province, and so she became a Russian citizen. Uh, do you want me to tell a little bit more about her life? Uh, she was the youngest daughter uh, of 14 children, which my grandmother had with her husband, who was a rabbi in Ismail. And he had married my grandmother on a uh, second marriage after his first wife had died. He was much, much older than she was. Uh, but since she had 14 children, my mother being the youngest, her uh, oldest brother was much, much older than she was. So um, it was a time of pogroms in Russia. And there were many, many pogroms some small, some big, but in particular, there was a very big pogrom in 1905. Uh, by then, most Jews were trying to emigrate. And so, um, the f my mother first 
oldest brother, the first two oldest brothers, emigrated to France in, uh, I would say, probably a year or so before she was born. She was born in 1896. Uh, they came to Paris. Instead of going to America, they probably went to France because they knew French. They were taught French in some of the schools that they were going to. And uh, in Paris, one of them went to work to support the other one. The oldest one went to work to support the youngest one. And the youngest one became a doctor. Med, uh, to medical studies became a doctor, married uh, a uh, student who was also to be a doctor, and had three children that were um, slightly younger than my mother. A little bit younger, not much. The oldest one was probably a year younger than she was. So in other words, her nephew was almost the same age as she was. Did your mother become a citizen of France? Yes, but I was just uh, telling you the story. It sounds a little long, but uh, because of the program, every one of the brother and sister emigrated. She was the last one to go, and the reason she went was because of that 1905 program. She uh, left when she was about 10 years old. And I suppose she came with one of those uh, Jewish outfits that helped Jews to emigrate from Russia, out of Russia. So when she arrived in France, she went to live with her brother. And um, her brother, having three small children, could not uh, put her up in the house. So she was only 10, he had to put her in a school, so he put her in a convent. And that's where she studied until um, she graduated. So when she was in France, about seven years, she became a French citizen. And that was in 1913. That's how I can fairly well tell when she arrived in France, you see. And when were your parents married? OK. So my parents were married in uh, 1921. The Temple de la Victoire, which was the biggest synagogue in Paris. And uh, they had a very large wedding, very big wedding. Uh, and uh, life was fairly uh, nice for them after they were married. They uh, moved first in a small apartment where I was born, Rue Richer. And uh, when my f sister was born, they moved. My sister, Rose Huguet, uh, was uh, 18 months younger than I was. So they moved then into a very large apartment in the 17th arrondissement of Paris, which is a very exclusive part of Paris. Could you describe the apartment that you lived in? Yes, uh, it was a large apartment uh, with uh, maids rooms upstairs, as uh, most apartments in Paris at that time were uh, built that way. Uh, there was a foyer, large foyer when you came in. There was a very, very large dining room uh, with um, chandelier and baccarat and mahogany dining room tables that could sit, I don't know, like 30. And um, there was a large living room uh, following the dining room. Then there was a... What was in the living room? What kind of furniture was oh, in the living well, room? Oh, well, there was a lot of Persian rugs. Uh, we had a lot of uh, Louis XV, Louis XVI type furniture, a lot of tables all over the place. Uh, it was very, uh, it's very <laughs> posh, but at the same time, it was uh, the type of uh, furniture that they had that in the 20s. That uh, there was a kind of uh, uh, atmosphere that was uh, neo-oriental. Uh, that was the style of the period. My, for example, my mother's bedroom 
was inspired by um, Egypt, Egyptian type supposedly furniture and I remember very clearly that she had a bed, a bed uh, at which corner there were two huge uh, flower pots but made into stucco or something. And every time you went around her bed, you would bang your knees against the flower pot. It was terrible. But, uh, and then there was a corridor that led to uh, two or three bedrooms, one for my sister and I, one for one of the maids, so the one was upstairs, and then there was a, a kitchen. So it was quite large and involved. It was one of those um, buildings that had been built at the turn of the century, very imposing. You know, across the street from us, there, were, there was a, um, a uh, what we call in French an hotel particulier, town house of some kind. And in there lived the, the painter Van Dongen. I don't know if you heard of him. It's a fa famous painter of the 20s that is exhibited there all over, where he lived across the street from us. And when we were uh, little, uh, my sister and I were often invited to play with uh, his children. And I remember very clearly that uh, one of the things that fascinated us is that we were always served Ovaltine for four o'clock snack, you know, good day. And it, it impressed me very much then. I remember to this day, the Ovaltine we received at Van Dongen's house. And um, it, he used to give parties, uh, very fashionable parties, and we could hear the music and people dancing from across the street. And uh, so it was a very exciting time. Did your parents have any specific or any kind of Jewish affiliation? Um, because of the fact that my mother was raised in a convent and thereafter went to medical school, um, she kind of uh, let go of her uh, practice of Judaism. Because, of course, her father was a rabbi, so where she came from, I'm sure, it was uh, all the, uh, uh, all the, how do you say, uh, the, the custom were followed. But when she came to Paris, she became totally assimilated. And so um, she did go with my father to temple at the time of high holidays. I remember because we used to get all dressed up and go there, and I recall very clearly that uh, we had to go upstairs and we couldn't stay downstairs with the men. I remember that at, at the time I thought that was so, well, you know, different. <laughs> so we would be with the women upstairs and the men would be downstairs at the high holidays, but that's about all we, um, we followed. But we always had matches around the house and we always, uh, at matzo ball and whatever. I mean, the Jewish cooking she did continue uh, doing. She was not as strict when it came to changing dishes or, or that, that stuff. How about so we pork? never ate pork, ever. That was when I said, or shrimp. Or, you know, she kind of uh, adjusted the, the rules uh, to suit her. Mm -hmm. How about school? What kind of school did you go to? Well, I went to, uh, for elementary school, I went to a lycée, which was called, it's still called Lycée Carnot, and it was the old boys' school except for the elementary grades, and I was there until uh, I became what's called in America junior high school. Um, I remember one incident in which I may have been, you know, in maybe what in America would be considered second or third grade, uh, and uh, a girl had called me a dirty Jew or something like that, and I told my mother, and I remember very clearly my mother marching me to school and 
going to see the teacher and getting very upset about that, how the teacher had allowed or something like that, not said anything. And that stayed in, stayed in my mind, you know, she, she was very um, angry at this. How did the teacher react? Well, it's, as I recall, she was not too, um, I remember her name, her name was Mademoiselle Arigui. And, but she was not too uh, sympathetic to the whole thing. She said, yes, 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 but I don't think anything ever happened to the other girl. However, nobody else called me a dirty Jew after that, so maybe she did something. Um, did you ever feel different because you were Jewish at any time while you were in school? Uh, yes. Um, in France, there had been a lot of anti-Semitism, especially in the 30s, but even before. Um, I don't know if you know that there was, a, at the turn of the century, a big scandal called l'affaire Dreyfus. And thereafter, there was a total separation of church and state. But the, the fact that there has been such anti-Semitism remain uh, uh, with a big segment of the population. There was a whole group in the 30s called Les Croix de Feu, which uh, manifested and started, especially after Hitler began uh, his campaign, started anti-Semitic slogan and anti-Semitic campaign. So, what we kind knew. of campaigns? What what kind of things? Oh well, um, especially when Leon Blum was um, the prime minister uh, in France, and he was Jewish, of course, and socialist. Uh, there was constantly in the newspapers, the whitest newspaper would uh, uh, be full of anti-Semitic uh, remarks. I mean, anti-Semitism was openly uh, written about. I mean, it was not hidden like today here. I don't think anybody could write any particularly anti-Semitic newspaper. I mean, they would be arrested or something. But in France, there were such a thing. There were famous writers who wrote anti-Semitic book, anti-Jewish book, so uh, we knew it was there. And uh, so my sister and I, but I, I remember myself, I knew I was different, you know, we were Jewish, even though we did not practice, we were Jewish, and that was that. I mean, I was conscious of my Jewishness from the time I was born. My mother never said the contrary. She kind of always told me I was Jewish, you know. How did that make you feel, being in, in uh, this is your country and you were born here, your sister yeah, was born uh, here? Yeah, it's very hard. I never quite, as I think back, I don't think I ever quite felt one hundred percent that I belonged there. Uh, one of the things that my mother always told us, that you had to marry a Jew, you have to marry a Jew, you cannot marry somebody who is not a Jew. So it made it a little difficult later on whenever I met somebody, if he wasn't Jewish, you know, or that signed my mind, like, it's not somebody I can marry, he's not Jewish, you know. It was that consciousness that I had always, that I was Jewish and I was different. But on the other hand, I, uh, I was French too, you know, I, uh, I remember one day coming to my father and, and saying, um, uh, you know, uh, you know who your ancestors are? And uh, he said, what do you mean my ancestor? And I said, yeah, our ancestors were the Gauls, the Gaulois, that's what they taught us in school. And I said, our ancestor was the Gaul, and my father was hysterical. He said, it was so funny that I thought my ancestor was the Gaul, the German Gaul. I don't know why it stuck in my mind. But my parents um, received a lot at that time because my father had a big import business. So we used to have um, very large parties, uh, dinners and the like. And um, he had become um, quite well known among the Romanian community in Paris. And uh, I remember that he was invited, uh, the King Carl of Romania came with his mistress, uh, Madame Lupescu, I think she was, 
and he came for a visit in Paris and my parents were invited at the Romanian embassy to meet them and my mother was all dressed up in a beautiful pink dress with little beads all along the way and um, they were an important part of the Romanian community, not particularly Jewish, but Romanian community. But then came the crash of 1929, 30, 31, and my uh, father lost his uh, business and uh, couldn't make a go. It was a very difficult time. The depression had begun, uh, had begun and uh, we had to move. And so after that, I had a different life. So in other words, when I m moved to junior high, my life changed greatly also. I, uh, what kind of apartment were you in now when you moved? Now we moved to a much smaller apartment, so it was still fairly big by, uh, you know, it was five rooms with a kitchen and so on, but uh, it was not in a such fancy um, neighborhood. It was in the 18th arrondissement, which is near Montmartre, and uh, it was um, not far from the lycée where uh, I went which was now a girls' school, the Lycée Jules Ferry, all girls. So uh, that's where I did my studies. Uh, the Lycée was, uh, had probably been started quite uh, at the end of the 19th century. To, uh, the, the rooms were not called number one, two, three, four, they were called by flowers names. So you went into the rose room, the gardenia's room. <laughs> that shows you the type of school. But it was a fairly nice school. We, we had, wore uniform with our name embroidered on the side. And um, I was uh, going home for lunch, because you could be what we call demi-pensionnaire, half intern. But I was going for home for lunch. So I some f uh, friends, but not the type of friend as you would have here when you go to school and you bring your friends home and so on. We never had that in France. We, outside of school, we didn't see our friends. We were just restricted to the family circle. But I, uh, I did not have a bad time in school because I had a very understanding mother. If I didn't feel like going to school, I didn't go to school. She would write me a note to excuse me or whatever. So uh, I never felt pressured, you know. And uh, my parents were uh, always there. Unfortunately, we always had uh, money problems. Very difficult for my father to find a job. And um, especially since he really did not have any professional um, uh, skills. I mean, uh, he had probably, uh, as I th mentioned, I think, uh, during the pre-interview, he had um, been an officer in the Romanian army, so it makes me presume that he had a college education, because otherwise he wouldn't have been able to be an officer. But um, it was nothing that could be useful to him in terms of uh, gaining employment. So it was, he worked for as an accountant, but he was not officially an accountant, so he would work for a small firm, and he had a very hard time. My mother went back to work as a midwife, and uh, we were really short of money. And that's what I remember most about uh, my junior and senior high school years. What was the makeup of the school, as Jewish as opposed to non-Jewish? What would you no, say? No, there were no Jews. Were you the only Jew in the Probably, school? Yeah, I never even inquired. I don't even think that I, uh, the question came up. I was surrounded by uh, French girls, but uh, there was no, no religious function or anything of the like that could have made me uh, see there were some or not. Also, my relative did not live very far away, and I would visit them all the time. So I was 
still in a Jewish atmosphere, if you want, but um, it was totally separated, the family and the school, the total separation. How about you and your sister? Were you close? Oh, well, my sister was always behind me. She was 18 years younger, and uh, wherever I went, she went. She was one of the things that I told my um, daughter after she had her twins, make sure they don't go to the same place all the time, because I really feel that it was uh, one of the things that my mother encouraged, and I don't think it was right. She never let her do her things. She would always go together someplace, always watch for your sister, you know? And I think that in, actually it affected her life, made her very dependent on me. But we were... Uh, How did that make you feel? Very often resentful, because I couldn't do anything without having my sister with me. Everywhere I went, so I didn't ever uh, go anywhere alone at, at that stage of my life. But it was always my, my sister. My first cousin, who was the daughter of my uncle, the oldest brother, the doctor, my first cousin, Ed Allison, who was three months older than me, and he was in effect like my brother. We also were together all the time. So we were, uh, Roger was his name, uh, Huguette, myself, and Michelle, who was the other sister's uh, son, who was much younger, was about six years younger than us. And the four of us were always together everywhere, somehow. Everywhere, anything we did, we were always together. So that's, those were my um, playmates, let's say. What were your goals as a young person looking towards the future at that time in your life? I was going to be a doctor like the rest of the family. You know, except for my father, everybody went to medical school in my family. So I was going to be a doctor, and that was that. I was not going to um, work as a teacher because... That's a lower social class, my point of view. <laughs> of course, I became a teacher, but um, I wasn't going. And, and anything else I couldn't do because the social classes were very firmly um, distinguished in France at that time. Uh, if you were of the haute bourgeoisie, consider yourself haute bourgeoisie, you did not work in a store and you did not work in certain uh, so-called law type pro profession. So the only thing you could do was to go to law school or to go to medical school. And this is why all the women in my family went to one of the other, because that's the only thing you could do. We're going to change the tape now. Okay. Am I talking too fast? Tape two, Ida Nelson. You were just talking about your goals and that you yes, were going to be a doctor. Yes, I was going to be a doctor. Uh, but um, it was something that was so set that I really never uh, thought too much about it. This was going to be where I was going. Um, you asked me uh, if uh, I had some political affiliation and I told you I did not have any. One of the reasons was that it was not considered what a girl of a good family would do to get involved. However, uh, later on, a little bit later, when I was uh, into, um, uh, at the university, uh, there was a lot of groups that were from uh, youth group, in particular, uh, communist youth group. And I was invited once to a dance sponsored by a communist group. And I went because it was a dance, not because it was a party. 
but I didn't like it at all. I uh, thought the people there were uh, not my, my type, not my class or whatever. And so that was that. Uh, in terms of uh, belonging to, there were some Jewish group, groups, but you had to have contact with them through a, a synagogue or temple. And since I didn't go, I really did not have any contact with them. So, honestly speaking, I did not have really any political activity. Also, we were always talking politics at home. I mean, it's not like we were uh, totally uh, blinded by what was going on. On the contrary, we were very conscious of the reprisals that were happening in Germany and elsewhere. And um, my father had some uh, uh, friends and that came to visit him, uh, told horrible stories about what was go going on. It was in the 30s. I'm talking what about. What were they telling him? Were they coming from Germany? No, they were coming from Romania, yes. And uh, they were very petrified about what could happen to them. And so, uh, and so I, I was aware of what was going on. And of course, we saw in, in newsreel and movies we saw and heard Hitler and his screaming and, and so there were, up to 1930, uh, 1940, there was uh, enough information so that we knew that some catastrophic events were happening. Was there any talk in any way of trying to leave or did you, well, what did it, you think? Well, trying to leave was not easy because in the first place, the only place you could go would have been America. And in order to come to America, you needed a sponsor. Without a sponsor, you could not go. On top of that, there were quotas at the time. And Romanian, which my, both my parents were, Romanian, there were so many people trying to enter uh, America on a quota that it would have taken years and years and years of wait to be able to emigrate. But wasn't your mother a French citizen? Well, my mother was a French citizen in 1913. She became a French citizen. When she married my father, however, she became Romanian. Uh, in order, there was a law that was passed in 1927 or 28, which stated that if uh, you had been a French citizen, or if you wanted French citizenship, you had to apply for it. If you were a child born in France of foreign uh, born parents. And my father applied for us and we became officially French citizens. But my mother neglected for some reason or another, I think she had difficulty finding papers or whatever, she neglected to make the request for herself. So as a result, even so she was never Romanian except by marriage, she was arrested as a Romanian. So uh, it was one of the strange things, because really she was Russian more than Romanian. But um, when did things start to change? When did you really feel that things were beginning to change for you? By this time, 1938, 1939, oh. what level of, of class were you in? in well, uh, in, sc oh, in school I was, uh, in, I graduated in 1939 from high school. Uh, high school is really a year or so beyond the uh, American high school. So I graduated rather well, as a matter of fact, with what we call mention bien, which surprised my teacher greatly. She didn't think I would do it, but I did. And um, it was now 1939. And the situation was very bad, but I did register anyway uh, for medical school, for the first year of medical school. How was the situation bad? Can you describe what well, you mean? Well, uh, it was bad in the sense that uh, the Germans were uh, uh, ready to uh, declare war. I mean, it was a time where, uh, what's the name of the British minister who went over to uh, uh, to talk peace, he was going to invade, um, he, he invaded Czechoslovakia and Austria in thirty-eight. Oh, Chamberlain, Chamberlain, yeah, I forgot his name. Chamberlain, went, so we knew that the situation was bad. 
actually French people did not want a war. Everybody was afraid of the consequences of war. The First World War was just barely 20 years before. Most of the French people had served that in the f First World War, and those that survived remember the horrors of it. So France was really a pa pacific country, uh, country at the time. And when General managed in 38, I think, to uh, quiet Hitler for a while, everybody was very happy. However, in 39, the situation got worse. And um, How did it affect you personally, though? Well, it affected me in the sense that the French went to war. In, when Hitler invaded Poland, the French went, followed England and declared war. And from that moment, we had a sense of doom, all of us. We felt that there was a sword hanging above our heads because we knew what was going to be if by any chance Hitler managed, managed to uh, conquer uh, France. Did you, did you feel that sword of Damocles because just war against France or because you were Jew? Oh, because or? I was Jew, because I was a Jew. I mean, uh, What did you know about Hitler that affected you that way? At, by that point, what did you know? I knew that there had been all kind of repression. I'd heard of a crystal night. Of course, it wasn't called crystal night then, but it was the night where uh, they, they broke all the Jewish stores and I... Uh, uh, knew that they were arresting people and putting them in camp. But you have to understand, so we always thought that this could not happen in France. We always thought that French, the French government would never allow this to happen in France. I mean, the French Jews were so assimilated that they were absolutely convinced that the French people would not allow, if ever Hitler managed to come in, would not allow such a thing. So we always kind of looked at this uh, arrest from the outside. We were, oh, those poor uh, Polish Jews, those poor Czech Jews, those poor Germans, but it won't happen in France. However, we still were afraid. We were very much afraid. I remember coming home uh, one day in September and seeing my family in tears and started crying too because the war had been declared. We knew it was going to be terrible. However, the, the first year was like a kind of statu quo, you know. Um, uh, the, for one year, nothing really happened until Hitler decided to invade Ireland and, and Belgium, and that was the following spring. So the first winter, lots of people were sent in the trenches. They still had the Maginot Line. We thought that would save France. Um, foolishly, they thought that uh, Hitler would not, will not th would not think of going through Belgium like they had done when really, he tried to do in the First World War. And so people were going on the Maginot Line, and I remember knitting socks for my uncle who was, had been uh, uh, drafted as a doctor. And so um, I went to school, and personally, it was very curious because on one hand I was very frightened about the events, but on the other hand, for the first time in my life, I was in a school that was co-ed. I had never been in a school with boys before. And of course, being now 18, 17, 18, I spent more time going out with boys than I did with studying my books. So it was uh, not it was like a schizophrenic life, if you want. On one hand, you were petrified of what was going to happen to you, but on the other hand, as a young girl, I was living my life uh, fairly normally. Until, of course, the German invaded Ireland, and uh, then Belgium, and then went right through France, like there was no resistance whatsoever. And they were going to occupy Paris, and that was in June. And at that point, uh, my... June of which year? 1940. And my parents oh, finally realized the danger that we were all in. And not only my parents, but all French, all French people were petrified at the idea of uh, uh, 
the German entering Paris. So there was like a mass exodus of Paris the, the week before, from the week before the German arrived and the time they arrived, everybody in Paris was trying to move out. And you must have seen pictures on the road of people trying to move out with cars and anything that could move on the road trying to escape the German and of course trying to move out by train. Uh, what did your family do? Well, we would have gone out by car, borrowing my uncle's car who was in the army, but we couldn't find any gasoline. There was no gasoline to be had. So um, we decided maybe two days before uh, Hitler uh, came into Paris, we decided to try to leave by train. We went to the station. What did you take with you? Very little, because, uh, you know, we took with us uh, the little money we had and some change of clothes, but you couldn't carry huge suitcases when you did not know how you were going to travel. So we took small suitcases. We went to the, uh, I think it was the Gare de Lyon, pretty sure it was the Gare de Lyon, one of the stations in Paris, and it was mobbed. It was mobbed. It was in front of the station. There were mass of people trying to get in the, st the regular station. It was impossible. So after uh, an hour or so standing away in the back, we saw that we had no chance of leaving that way. So my father decided to go around the station to see if there was another entrance. And he found another entrance in the back. And by some miracle, the gates were open, there was nobody there, so we went through the back of the station among the various uh, old uh, cars that were there, I mean uh, wagons that were there, and we arrived on a platform and a train was just pulling in, an empty train. We got in the train, there was nobody there, and then all of a sudden, the mass of people that were let out from the station to fill that train and that train filled up in like five minutes. It was unreal, but we had been lucky finding a place. Now, it, that train was going toward the south, to Toulouse, and I remember we waited in the train quite a while until it finally started moving. It was a very slow train, it was stopping at every stop along the way. But we finally arrived, I think it was in um, Limoges. And there, uh, the train stopped and we uh, were let out and I think they had provided some kind of, the town had provided some kind of, of, of food for us because I remember like a, a huge uh, room, I don't know, it must have been a school room or something, but there was a huge room a lot of refugees uh, sleeping on the floor and, and kind of mattresses and stuff. And we stayed there overnight and then the next day we took a train toward Toulouse and from there, to the, from there a smaller train toward the town part of France. We were going to the town because my aunt, my uh, father's sister, uh, had uh, uh, taken, had left met a couple of months before us because she lived in Lille and I don't know if you know Lille in the northern part of France and the minute she knew that the Germans were in Belgium she had left quickly Lille with her son, she was a widow and she had gone to a relative of her dead husband uh, that lived in the southern part of France so she was there and we knew it. So that's where we went because it was the only person, the only contact we had for the southern part of France. And uh, it was so different after Limoges when we took that train to, everything was so peaceful, so quiet. It was like if it was, there was no war. It was like we were back in time because this is a part of France that was the least developed at the time. A very pretty part of France, but very 
like uh, backwoods of France. So we arrived and uh, we called her from the station where we were at. I believe it was Castres, the station, but I'm not sure. And um, she lived at the time with a kind of landowner who owned a rather large property and uh, with a, even a little castle on it. And he was um, a rightist guy. He had been in the army, was a kind of retired colonel. And he had taken in his uh, relative by marriage and her son, but he wasn't too keen on taking us in. So he, he came to the station and he decided, he took us back to the house, I recall, but then he made a phone call to a neighbor of his and they decided to put us with that neighbor. She accepted to take us in. Now she was also a old-fashioned landlady. Uh, she had a manor, uh, like you know, very, very big house with um, a little hamlet next to it with about five or six uh, little houses of farmers and they were cultivating her, the, the fields for her, for her. She had two sons in the army and so she had two empty rooms, that's where she put us. However, she um, let us eat in the kitchen, we didn't eat with her, we ate in the kitchen with the basin and it was such an extraordinary part of my life. I mean, it's like going back, you know, 50 years or 100 years because they were really living a life which was totally gone, uh, obsolete in terms of the Parisian type of life that we had. But being young, you know, I, I made the best of it. How about your parents? My parents were devastated. They were so, first of all, they were constantly worried how long will the money last. Then they knew we could not stay there. They did not know, know what to do, where to go. And they, um, they were, uh, my mother was totally unhappy. My father was at the last, you know. It was very hard for them. I think that uh, I have been lucky that I was the age I was when all of that happened because I had much more resilience in taking, getting adjusted to things and also... How about your sister? How was she? During well, this? she was uh, more troubled than I was. She was more troubled than I was. But uh, she, you know, we still had our parents, so we didn't have to worry so much. Our parents were going to take care of us, so we didn't worry half as much as they did. They were very worried. But I would go in the, take a long uh, walk in the field and act like if I was a, a lady of the manor, you know, all the farmer was saluting me and so on. It was quite bizarre. Anyway, my father decided I really should take my examination because I had left so precipitately Paris that all the examination had been cancelled. So I was still supposed to be in my first year of medical school. And uh, there was emergency examination given in Faculty of Medicine in uh, Toulouse for people like me because Toulouse was one of the centers. Uh, it, it has a big university there, so all the young people can Jews that they went to the southern uh, France had to leave the um, uh, Paris. Uh, gravitated towards the university center so they can, could continue their examination. So there was a lot of people there. Uh, my father arranged for me to live in somebody's house as a boarder uh, for a week or so while I was taking my examination. So I went there to take my examination and uh, I was living with a family that was uh, French family was a crazy, <laughs> I would think. And I was starved all the time. They hardly fed me. And um, Why were they rather crazy? They were crazy because their daughter was a nurse who thought, for example, that um, chocolate was poison. 
Now, I was stuffing myself with chocolate because I was always angry. And so she was making such a fuss every time she would eat, see me eat chocolate that um, I got very annoyed at that. Then they, they kind of uh, uh, wonder why I was not studying. Well, there was a good reason why I was not studying. I didn't have books. So I had to go try to find books in the library, which was not easy because everybody else had the same idea. So the long and short is that I, very, I studied very little. But I met in Toulouse a number of uh, distant relatives from Paris, in particular two young men who were on their way to join the free forces or try to go to England. As I don't think the free forces were, the goal was there yet, maybe it was in Algeria. They were trying to leave France. So they were about my age, you know, two young men. So I spent my time with them in cafes and talking to them and what we were going to do. And of course, everybody's life was disrupted. So the net result of all of that is that I failed my exams. I felt everything, and I don't think they were very hard on us, but I really felt everything. So I went back to, my, to the house, and my father then decided this was time we should go back to Paris, because he saw it was dis disrupting our lives, and he had no, not much hope that we would accomplish anything there. We couldn't work. So in September, we went back to Paris. In September 1940, we went back to Paris. And we found the apartment there. And I registered in um, law school now because I felt medical school, so I thought law school would be easier and shorter time. And uh, my Did you have any problem registering at all? Uh, not at that time yet. At that time, we were... Um, we were not singled out as Jews yet. This happened in the following year. Um, when we went back, it was still fairly normal. How about your sister? Did she well, go to She school went too? to the uh, Beaux Arts, l'école des Beaux Arts. She was gifted in uh, drawing. My father was very gifted as an artist. He could draw all kind of things. So she went to the Beaux Arts, and I went to law school. And did your father find a job? He was working again, import, export, little jobs here and there, but... And your mother, did she have uh, to work? My mother was uh, sometime as a midwife, but you know, it was not steady because it depended if she was recommended to somebody who was, going, was pregnant and then she would stay with that family for two or three weeks, that's how it worked. She would stay there uh, from the moment they were giving birth for about two or three weeks. So I went back to school, and now um, the whole atmosphere on the left bank where the university was, was totally different from the year before. How, how was it different? Well, the year before, it was a regular uh, town for students, you know. It's like a huge campus. But now there were Germans everywhere. And, uh, were they in uniform? Germans in uniform banners all over the place, those huge white banners with the uh, um, cross, you know, the German cross everywhere. Uh, many places had been taken over for this headquarters, that headquarters. On the Place de la Concorde, there were those huge banners all over the place. It was a headquarter for, I don't know, the Gestapo or something. Um, it, everybody was very nervous. And there was little um, collaboration between French and, and German that I could see. I mean, there was definitely a division between the French and the German. Uh, also, I think I'd become a little bit more studious after all my experience, so I spent much more time in class, in classroom, um, in the library, and uh, while I still uh, met f friends, uh, students, and cafes, you know, that's on the Boulevard Saint-Michel. Uh, I still worked much more with my books. But 
around September, I think the end of September or the beginning of October, a decree was passed, um, a ruling, um, there is a word in French and I can think of it, from the Germans saying that all Jews had to register. That's a bit and what year is this then? That's 1940, September, or October 1940. And that was, uh, I often wonder why we went and we registered. But then I, in the building where we were, you know, the concierge, the neighbors, they knew we were Jewish. I mean, they knew we didn't go to church. And so... Um, were there a lot of Jewish people? families in the building that you were no, in? No, there were, there was only one, but we had lived there so many years and the uh, concierge had a little girl that was my age when we had first moved in. And whenever we talked, we never hid the fact that you were Jewish before the war. So it was very difficult unless you decided to change apartment, get false paper, which nobody thought of doing. Uh, moved to the south of France, if you wanted to stay where you were, you had to declare. And we were not the only one because we had to declare we were Jewish at the Hotel de Ville, the town hall. And the lines were huge. I remember waiting on line with all the other Jews of Paris waiting to declare that we were Jewish. And they took our names, our address, and so on. That was that. Okay, that was that. But now we were declared as Jews. Then uh, they started with um, all Jews will now wear a... Um, no, I think first they said that you had to put um, a sign in the window saying uh, Affaires Juives, Jewish business. Then they gave a kind of uh, supervisor to every business that was supposed to look over the books and so on, take over the business when they would get rid of the Jews. So that was the next uh, thing. Then they said that um, uh, Jews uh, would have uh, to come and have a stamp put on their ID card. And so we had to go and have our car stamp Jews. And I don't know if it's at the same time or shortly after we had to go and pick up our Jewish stars. Yellow stars, Jewish ju uh, written on it. And We're going to change the tape now. Tape three, Ida Nelson. So you had these Jewish stars that said Juif on it? Yes. Um, um, 1 October 1941. And um, I remember that uh, we were not given very many of them. As a matter of fact, I think all we got each was two uh, very bad fabric. So we were supposed to sew them on your coat or jacket and then remove them and sew them again uh, on the next uh, garment that you were wearing. Uh, some people would uh, stick them in their pockets and uh, just pull them out if they were asked but that was illegal. Uh, I s sewed mine under my uh, le pair and I was covering it more or less with my le pair However, uh, it was still quite traumatic because people were looking at you. You were walking the street and people were looking at you. And um, by then, I had started uh, bleaching my hair blonde to look less Jewish. And uh, so I didn't look Jewish at all, according to the stereotype. And uh, I remember once going in the subway 
and living um, by the way we couldn't sit anywhere we had to sit in the last uh, wagon of the train but I remember sitting there and two women in front of facing me uh, were whispering went to each other oh, look she doesn't look Jewish and so on and, and that kind of remark was very upsetting so you were like uh, wearing a scarlet letter you know and uh, so uh, it was it began to be very difficult uh, by then uh, and a lot of interdiction came to be placed we were not supposed to go to public places we were not supposed to uh, shop except at certain time we were not uh, supposed to uh, eventually register in university and of course we were not supposed to travel absolutely forbidden to travel what kind of travel does that mean, mean within the city or outside I mean outside of the city we were not allowed to travel outside of the city uh, by then there was a number of uh, acts of sabotage that were uh, uh, consummated and a lot of uh, arrests of people as hostages that were shot you know so you never knew if somebody around the corner was not all of a sudden to arrest everybody in the street just because there was uh, a train blown up the night before or, or something like that so it became very difficult to even travel within the city you were very much afraid I was afraid and nervous and so was my sister and so were my family did you ever see anything like that happen yourself oh sure oh sure we could you describe an incident like well, that we were always uh, on the lookout like uh, on the boulevard Saint Michel where there were always so many uh, students uh, they would uh, for example we were sitting in a cafe and all of a sudden you would see five or six uh, uh, German soldiers coming in and starting asking for um, uh, papers and first thing you did was to try to find a way to get out of that place without being seen and often they arrested people for example they would arrest all the men or they would arrest men and women it was very erratic but this happened in a cafe but it happened in the street too you were always trying to watch out to make sure that there was nothing of the kind uh, going on where you were going <coughs> and then <coughs> I think it was around January uh, the Germans started arresting Jews by coming to their home and arresting them and they started with the foreign Jews and Polish Jews and uh, all kind of Jews and were the were the foreign Jews those Jews they were considered to have come in within the last few years yes, or yes it it was I suppose the Jews that had come uh, more recently because I, I think that Jews that had lived uh, longer in France had become French Jews except for my parents but they had tried to become uh, to get the French nationalities but I don't know I don't remember which group particularly they arrested but it was systematic they arrested uh, Jews systematically as of somewhere around January so by uh, by June or July uh, everybody was trying to leave Paris every Jew was trying to leave Paris one way or another did things change for you in school during this time from January to uh, June my school did not it didn't change the sense that the courses were still being given the exam were still being given and lucky for me because that's the way I managed to complete my degree because I spent two years in law school and that was enough to make me to give me uh, a degree in law, a bachelor in law degree, but were there a lot of Jews in your class and in, in university? There were some, but uh, uh, most of them did not wear the yellow star, so it's harder to spot them because, as young people, very quickly we decided 
we were a target with the uh, stars. Better take our chances, try not to avoid the German, and not to wear it. Is so, that what you did? Yes. So you put it in your pocket, and we figured, you know, if emergency come, we can always put it in with a pin or something, which, of course, was sure f if you were arrested, that was it. But then, if you were arrested, you had the stamp on your card anyway, so you didn't wear it. But uh, still, I know everybody knew that everybody had somebody that they knew that had been arrested, I mean, a relative or whatever. So people were leaving Paris. And uh, in order to do so, you had to pass the demarcation line. And the demarcation line was patrolled by German. And so Germans and French, but mostly Germans. And so you just could not take a train and go and hope to get to the other side. It was like a regular uh, border, and you had to show papers and whatnot. So it was, you, as a Jew, you couldn't do it. The only way you could cross was to cross somehow illegally by having somebody crossing you at certain places where they knew that the Germans were not patrolling. This was difficult to find, and it was costly. It was cost a lot of money. My uh, cousin Roger, you know, his father was uh, head of the insurance company, and he had a lot of um, places, uh, how do you call it, uh, in different parts of Paris, he had seats for his company. And different so branches. Branches, that's what I was looking for. He had a lot of branches and he had a lot of employees. So he managed to uh, contact one of his employees in the city of Tours. That was very close to the demarcation line. And he arranged for us to meet that man at a certain time in Tours so that he should put us across. Uh, I went to visit him like a day before in his um, office and uh, he gave me all the papers and gave me all kind of recommendation and we, the family had decided that the young people would go first and then they would come. So, because there was also a question of money and then also a question that the men could not supposedly put across too many people at the same time. Four was all he wanted. So one morning, we went in front of the Gare Saint-Lazare railway station, and I met my two cousins. And <coughs> we went in the station to take the train. Now, my two cousins had not registered as Jews because uh, the father of one, my youngest cousin, had managed to buy for himself and his wife and his son the citizenship from Monaco. So as such, they were considered Monaco citizens, they didn't have to register. And my other cousin, his father was the one who arranged this uh, transport, was uh, not Jewish. So both of them had a paper that allows them to travel. So they went into the station and went to three, they were in. But we had our card stamped Jews, so it was very difficult. But again, we were lucky because there was a mob at the door. A lot of people were traveling by train going here and there. And so while there was a, a check by uh, both a French uh, uh, railroad attendant uh, and uh, a German, we managed to, while they were checking a family with a lot of baggage and people, we managed to squeak through and we were never checked. So we were lucky there. So we went into the station platform and we got into the train for tour, which was very crowded. We stood the long way, it was about three or four hours, and then we got to tour. In tour, we met the person, how we recognize him, I don't, I forgot, but we had some signal to recognize each other. We met him and he took us in his um, 
uh, truck, little truck, to a farm outside of Tours. Now, that farm was where we were supposed to wait until he would take us across. And it was very odd because it was again so very peaceful there. The farmer's wives served us lunch outdoors and we spent the whole afternoon talking to her. And like if you know, we were on a visit and in the meantime I was dying of fright. So anxious, you know, you had always that fear inside of you that somebody is going to come and ask for your paper. But we waited there, and around seven, or shortly before seven, I remember, he told us the, the farmer, the farmer, now it was not more the guy, it was a farmer, told us to put some scarf over our head and to, if ever we were stopped, to say we were um, peasant working the. the, the ground there and uh, we went into yeah, and he said if we are stopped that's what you have to say you are farm workers so we went into his truck and he took us through all kind of back roads but we are not stopped by anybody and he finally stopped the truck in front of a field and he said you see the other side over there that's the free zone one over there. Don't stop. One. So we got out of the, the truck and the four of us, we started running through the field like mad and running and running and running and finally we got on the other side and we kept on running on the road until finally we stopped running because we figured we finally had made it into the free zone. Incidentally, my mother wrote to me because when I finally arrived, when I was going, I wrote to her. She wrote to me that the guy that had taken us across was working a deal with a German patrol that one out of two transports they would take. And that's how he was working it. We were the lucky one. We were the one who went through. The next transport, they arrested everybody. So my mother and father were not able to take the same guy. So they had lost their contact and that's one of the reasons why they did not come to the free zone and were arrested. But so you were expecting that you were going with your sister first? Yes, and then, then they were supposed to come within the next couple of weeks at most, at most. So you, did you ever get to say any kind of real goodbye? No, never said goodbye. The last I remember of my mother was uh, on the front of the apartment on the how do you call a uh, staircase in front, uh, telling us, kissing us, saying goodbye, and watching us go down the stairs as we went out. That was it. I was so convinced that we were seeing them again, that it was just a, a short uh, trip. Anyway, we arrived on the other side, and um, it was night time by then, it was middle of the night, and we were exhausted. With them. We walked into a small town and there was a kind of inn there. We walked in and asked for two rooms and uh, we got two rooms and that was that. I mean the woman didn't seem to be surprised at all to see us. Obviously we were one of many coming across. And we got two rooms with, again I remember, old fashioned beds with thick um, down comforter and so on and that's where we spent the night. The next day, we somehow went to a station and took a train for, um, I think it was Clermont-Ferrand. And uh, we were in the free zone of France, so under Marshal Pétain, supposedly uh, less uh, hostile to the Jews. Um, my two cousins started fighting with each other. They were, my youngest cousin was about 15, he was a pain in the neck at that age. And the oldest one was about uh, my age, 20, maybe about 14 and 20, 20, yeah. So uh, we were very happy really when they separated from us and went to Nice and Monaco. We went to Nîmes. And the reason we went to Nîmes is that my aunt Fanny, the one who 
we had met first when we went in the town, had finally abandoned her uh, whitest uh, cousin there, and I had moved from town to Nîmes. Uh, while she went there, I think she had some contact there from business a long time ago. And so she was surprised to see us sort of a sudden arriving. But, you know, we were the family, so she took us in. Now, she had an apartment on top of a cafe in the center of town. And uh, that apartment consisted of uh, a large bedroom, a small bedroom, a small dining room, a bathroom, and a small kitchen. So she gave us the small bedroom. Now, the small bedroom had one bed and a, a closet of some kind, an armoire. And when we went to make the bed, we discovered that the bed was, the mattress was covered with worms. And there was nothing we could do, so we turned the mattress over, we put blankets all over the mattress, and we slept on that bed. That's where we slept as long as I stayed in that apartment with her. We slept on that mattress covered with work, which was really horrible feeling, you know. Uh, Nîmes, again, was one of the towns where a lot of Jews were going all towards the southern part of France. There was a lot of, of Jewish young people in the town. Uh, in, at that time, uh, another cousin who was also a doctor with his wife, was also a lawyer and their small son, had joined my aunt in this town and they had not been able to find any place to sleep except a small room nearby. So they were eating their meals with my aunt and us. So there were a lot of people around that table and my poor aunt was cooking for everybody and we were supposed to help a little bit with the dishes and so on, more or less. But she had a lot of, um, she had a lot of work. Uh, How about money for buying food? Was food well, easy to get? Food was not easy to get. You know, there were uh, uh, ration, ration books and whatnot, and you got uh, practically no meat. You got a lot of rutabaga. I don't know if you know that's a kind of wood stuff and it was difficult. She was making a lot of soups and stuff which we didn't like too much but um, everybody had come with a little bit of money so we had a little money to, uh, to you know, survive. My aunt a little money, my cousin a little money so we managed to survive a little bit in the way of food. It's just that it was not uh, fruit and vegetable like you would get it now. But, uh, and you couldn't work, you couldn't do anything. Uh, so, for a while, it went on more or less well. Uh, I had met through a f girl, which I met somehow, talked to in the street, I don't remember how. I had met a, a, a number of uh, young Jewish people. Nîmes was not a very large city at that time. Today it has grown a lot, but now it was not a very large city. It was mostly uh, renowned for the Roman monuments that there was there. And um, How many people would you say were in Nîmes? Uh, at the time, maybe 20,000, maybe. Uh, of course, it's hard to tell because there were so many Jews beside, but there were one or maybe two or three large avenues, uh, maybe a dozen big cafes, and that was that. It was not, uh, you know, a huge metropolis. So it was easy to meet people. And through that f girlfriend, I met uh, two uh, fellows uh, whose name was Jack Levy and Philip Presber, and Jack, I fell in love with him on first sight, okay? So, uh, from then on, I was with him all the time. From the moment we met, I was with him all the time. He was coming to my house, I would go to his house, and... Uh, Where was your sister and all this? What happened to her? Uh, my sister was staying uh, home, uh, 
she was uh, working a little bit at drawing stuff, I don't know for whom, I don't remember. She did go out a little bit with um, uh, the girls that I had met, but uh, she was corresponding with my mother and, you know, uh, like, by September, we stopped having news from her. See, we had arrived around August. By September, we stopped. We got a letter from my mother, one letter that told us a story about the guy uh, that, had, you know, sold uh, some of the people that he put across. She also told us about one of my first cousins, who was a doctor, who uh, had been arrested. At the, Gestapo had come to arrest him in August, and he uh, had managed to escape through the balcony, foolishly decided to come back at night to get some money he had left, or some papers he had left in his office, and trying to get back in through the balcony again, he was denounced by somebody who saw the light and was arrested again, and was I ended up in Auschwitz and died. I think I gave you the name of the convoy you was on. So she wrote to us, and she was writing. She was writing to us that she was going to try to come soon, and she was uh, looking for a way. So was my father to cross the border, and then we had no more news. After September, October, we had no more news, and by November, we got a letter from one of my uh, cousins in Monaco, my cousin in Monaco, who uh, told us that they had been arrested. And of course it was very upsetting for my sister much more than for me, because uh, I was very upset too, but I, I had Jack and I was in love and when, you know, I had a shoulder to cry on. Well, she did not have that, and for her it was a very traumatic, very traumatic. For all of us it was traumatic, really, I mean, but certain degrees more for her than for me. So... What did you do for money then? Uh, we had no money. We were living off my hand. And then my cousin from Monaco... Uh, what was his name? It's a she. Her name was Ida, like me, such a my, my namesake, so to speak. And uh, she uh, wrote to us saying that uh, she would send us some money, and she did. She sent us some money through the post office uh, fairly regularly every month, as long as we were in Nîmes. When I moved to Nice, I used to go get the money, but in Nîmes she would send it. And, uh, she found a job working someplace. My sister, I forgot some kind of menial job, but she didn't last very long. Uh, basically, we were uh, kind of trying to find, you know, what to do when the German occupied the, the free zone. And that was, uh, now we were in the beginning of 43, I think the beginning of 1943, they occupied the free zone of France. And of course things became all of a sudden much worse because not only were there Germans everywhere, there was a Gestapo that happened on one of the big boulevards and now uh, when you were in a cafe it was filled with German and you never know if there was going to be a paper check Papier, you know, for a check, and so uh, everybody was uh, very, very nervous, and we did not know what to do. Meanwhile, um, Jacques had joined the resistance and uh, was uh, busy uh, putting in everybody's mailboxes at night uh, the news from the BBC that some people could get and he would give them the news of the war because we knew pr practically nothing what was happening. Did you join the resistance with him? No. I didn't. Why not? But I was never that kind of a person. For me it was too dangerous 
and uh, I had my sister to think of because I felt responsible. And uh, did Jacques have anybody that he was with there? Well, no. For Jacques, uh, his story was really very sad. When his parents were divorced, and his father thought he would put him in a safe place by sending him to live with a Polish Jewish family of friends of his, with two small children in Nîmes, and he thought, well, he would be safe in Nîmes. Who's going to arrest him in Nîmes? So. One day in March, by March, I was going up to visit him because it was his birthday. And uh, as I arrived in front of their house, which was a fairly big house in, the, in a very big garden, I saw on the gates, I saw the seals, the seals of uh, do not come across, you know, the yellow seals of uh, uh, properties that had been taken over. So I was absolutely, couldn't realize what it was. I went to one of the neighbors and asked him, what, what, what does that mean? And the neighbor said to me that uh, the Gestapo had come at night and arrested the family, the entire family, that Jack had tried to hide in the, in the garden and had succeeded. But when he saw that they were taking the children, with, he was very fond of them. Uh, they were taking away the children, the parents. He thought that they had come to arrest him because of his activities. And uh, so he gave himself up. So they arrested him too. And so they arrested everybody. Well, when I heard that, I was in a state of shock. And I did the most foolish thing that one can do. I ran down the hill all the way to the Gestapo seat, and I went and the Gestapo knocked on the big door, asked the guard outside if I could see somebody. And I asked, uh, after a while, they said, they asked me to wait in an office on the side, and they um, brought in an officer, and the officer asked me what I wanted, and I said that somebody had been arrested by mistake. And he asked me if I was Jewish, and I said yes. And so he took me by the arm and he said, get out. And he threw me out of his office. We're going to change the tape now. <laughs>